My eyes stung with dry pain, and I rubbed them with my palms, trying to massage the last bit of moisture into them from the insides of my eyelids. Like wringing out a sponge that's been sitting in the desert sun, there was little benefit. Still, I continued to stare at the computer screen in my home office, waiting for the final calculations to finish. If I was right about this, the dark silhouette of a planet I'd been staring at for the last two days really was capable of harboring life. Maybe even intelligent life. The thought seemed surreal and dreamlike. Further evidence of my exhausted state, it couldn't really be happening. It just wasn't possible. Was it? A second later and the status bar showed complete and the calculations were finally done. I began to read through the results, showing temperature variations and percentages of various compounds Reading down from the top, my heart began to hammer faster and faster in my chest. Nitrogen, 78%. Oxygen, 20.9%. Argon, 0.9%. Carbon dioxide, 0.03%. Additional gases, see further breakdown below, 0.17%. Median temperature, 58.43 degrees Fahrenheit. It was impossible. The composition of the atmosphere, the temperature, the size of the planet, and its proximity to its star, which just so happened to be a G-type yellow dwarf main sequence star. All of these features, they were identical to Earth, which meant I discovered the one planet every astronomer had dreamed of finding. The unicorn, the Goldilocks, the twin to our one-of-a-kind blue speck in the middle of the impossibly vast ocean that is space. If there was one place among the stars that could harbour intelligent life, this was it. I sent an email to my superiors, telling them what I'd discovered, but it bounced back, saying undeliverable. After several more attempts, I tried calling, but the line was always busy, no matter who I dialed. Frustrated and exhausted, I decided to wait until morning. The cell service in the area of Hawaii was notoriously terrible, so I tried from a landline the next day. I hadn't slept in 48 hours and it was all catching up with me at once, as my eyelids grew heavy and I wandered into the bedroom, collapsing onto the mattress. I fell asleep a second after my head hit the pillow and I drifted into a deep sleep filled with mysterious dreams of lost stars and hidden planets. I awoke to the sight of a bright, bluish white light. It glared at me from the end of my bed, an opening like a giant mouth. A silhouette emerged from the light, and then another. Just like the planet I had been watching through the telescope for so long, the figures blocked out a portion of that light, but only momentarily. And then there were hands roughly grabbing me and yanking me up from the warmth of my bed, pulling me across the floor with my feet, dragging abrasively along the rough carpeting. Hey, what are you doing? Where are you taking me? I shouted, thrashing as I came back to alert wakefulness. They said nothing, only gripping me tighter as we drew closer to the blue, swirling vortex of glowing light. We went into the portal, and I felt extremely warm, then extremely cold, but only for a brief moment until we came out the other side. Two robed figures stood before me, and I saw that we were on a rooftop, overlooking a vast city. The buildings were towering, their features angular and sharp, their highly reflective surfaces were tinged pink and blue, and I suddenly realised why they looked so bizarre. We're there, aren't we, on the planet I just discovered? The figures standing before me didn't say anything, they only stared blankly at me. As I observed the foreign planet in wonderment, I saw that the aliens who lived here were far more advanced than humans on Earth. This looked like a city from Star Wars. Floating spacecrafts docked and took off from ports built into massive skyscrapers. These gargantuan towers extended thousands of feet into the air, disappearing into the clouds above. Floating spacecraft of all sizes and shapes were traveling throughout the city, alighting on these docks like bees pollinating flowers. How did you know I found you? I asked. Can you even understand me? 
They didn't answer. You must be able to understand me if you could read my emails and intercept them. Why didn't you want my superiors to know about this place? Without responding, the taller of the two hooded figures nodded down to the streets far below us. I looked over the precipice and saw activity beneath us. A city full of life and aliens going about their day-to-day -day business. I couldn't make out much detail through the haze of the smog, but it looked dim and dreary down below. There was a noise and a flash of light, and we were suddenly standing there at street level. The aliens had advanced technology that allowed us to teleport through space in an instant, and they deployed it readily, it seemed. No walking around for these creatures, no elevators or stairs either. Vehicles which hovered above the ground at various levels packed the open air above the street. I looked up and saw that despite the added third dimension being employed to ease congestion, the traffic jams were still occurring. Each level of flying cars was honking, and there were creatures leaning out of the windows of the vehicles, barking in an alien tongue and gesturing with tentacles covered in fish hook claws on one side. Street vendors were selling paper plates filled with foul-smelling meat to customers who had lined up to purchase lunch. A dozen or more were standing near us, and I was careful to stay close to the hooded figures who were acting as my guides. The creatures of this planet were tall, wide, and gelatinous. They had proboscises instead of mouths, and tentacles instead of arms and legs, which they used to propel themselves. Similar to how octopuses move in a myriad of different ways, some of them walked in their back tentacles, almost like bipedal humans, while others slithered and moved snake-like across the pavement. They also changed colours, I noticed, depending on the background behind them. Surprisingly, none of them seemed to notice as the three of us stood, watching them silently from a shaded spot near a building. The hooded figure standing next to me raised an extremity which was shrouded in robes. I looked where they were pointing and saw something very odd. A man was coming out of the sewer grate in the middle of the street. Hovering cars were honking at him and splashing him with mud as they sped past. He seemed to not notice. His face was calm and passive and there was a collar around his neck covered in blinking lights. What the hell? I muttered, watching him go about his duties. But he was bringing buckets of brown, slimy muck up from the sewers. His face and clothing were smeared with it, and I could smell the disgusting stench from where we stood, at least 30 yards away. Why is there a person here? I asked the hooded figures. There can't be a person here. We're further away from Earth than any spacecraft is capable of traveling, assuming we are where I think we are. Then, a moment later, we teleported again. We were no longer on street level, but instead we were far below the ground in a dark mine. The sound of pickaxes, chisels and hammers could be heard over the cacophony of voices and minecarts which travelled across nearby rails. The voices were human, I realised, and we drew closer to see a group of men working at the walls with crude tools. Each one had that same collar covered in blinking lights snugly secured around their necks. They were the same colours as the one I'd seen the man wearing up on street level. Their faces were calm and passive, none of them looking angry upset. Instead, they wore no expression at all. As they loaded up mine carts full of rock material, I saw that once they were full, they would send them off down the tracks. More carts would come to take their place, and they would fill those up, sending them off down the track as well, in a never-ending monotony of movement. The men and women worked tirelessly, and none of them stopped for an instant to rest. I looked to my guides, beginning to grow angry. What is this place? What are you doing to these people? The hooded figures looked at each other and nodded, then turned back to me and revealed their faces. My guides were human, but they looked different battle-scarred and branded with strange numeric tattoos and barcodes which covered their skin. The one on the left was a man, the other a woman. Both had shaved heads and brown eyes. We needed to show you what would happen 
if you contact your superiors about this planet. If we didn't, then this timeline would become prime. Trust me, you don't want that. I looked back and forth between their unreadable faces, then again at the hordes of human servants being forced by giant aliens into servitude. I was terrified, but the scientist in me needed to know what all of this meant. And I'll admit, looking back, my pride was badly wounded just thinking about denouncing my findings. They were huge. I discovered another planet capable of supporting life in the most optimal conditions imaginable. Not only that, but there actually was life on this planet. What are you saying? I can't tell anyone about my findings or else this will happen? Let me guess, this is a simulation or a hallucination or something like that, right? This isn't even real? This is very real. This is the future if you choose to continue on the path you have chosen. Despite what you may think, this will come to pass within your lifetime if you do not follow what we tell you. I thought about this for a minute. I can't give this discovery to myself. I just can't. I live by a code as a scientist and I cannot break that code. I can't just keep something like this a secret. But don't worry, we won't try to contact this other planet. We'll just observe it. I'll be sure of that. The man turned to look at the woman. You were right. He's too stupid to save. No matter what we do, he'll tell them what he found. She sighed. I regret to say that you're right. We'll have to leave him here. She snapped her fingers, and I noticed that a slight hissing sound which had been surrounding me without my notice was suddenly gone. Like when the power goes out and you realize how quiet it is without the fridge running. The aliens and all of the humans nearby turned to look at me. And I realized they could see me now. He's trying to escape, one of the men nearby said, blandly, with no emotion. His collar blinked yellow, then green, making a pleasant chiming noise. His eyes rolled back in his head as if he had just received a boost of dopamine to his brain. I'll stop him, a woman near me said, reaching out to grab hold of me. He is tall and looks strong. He'll be a good worker for the mines. I pulled away from her, and several others started moving in towards me, from all around. Help, oh, please, I won't say anything. Just let me go back. I want to go back. I screamed, trying to get back into the faint, hazy blue bubble surrounding my host. The people who had brought me to this place could no longer be seen inside but I imagine them shaking their heads. I'll tell them that this planet is a wasteland, uninhabitable. Please, just let me go back. They seem to consider this. After a few long moments, just as the dirty hands of the mining prisoners all around me were about to grab a hold of me, they pulled me back into the protective bubble of invisibility. Once I was back inside, they looked at me sternly, and the woman began to speak. We are from the future, even past this one, when humans stand up against their captive overlords and begin to fight back. Unfortunately, we are outnumbered and outgunned. However, we have managed to gain one advantage. A mission to capture several pieces of enemy technology allowed us this one opportunity, this one chance to go back in time and fix things. Now that you have seen it firsthand, you must understand why you cannot share your findings about this planet with anyone for as long as you live. You must keep this place a secret, the man said gravely. I will. I can see now that this is real and that you're trying to protect us from contacting these creatures for a reason, I said, too terrified to argue with them. We all talked about this possibility amongst each other in the break room, in the lab, around the computers while looking at images of planets we discovered. The question was on all our minds. What if we find intelligent life? But it turns out they're much more advanced. What if they're a super predator and they don't want to share this universe with anyone else? That is exactly why you must keep this a secret. I repeat, you cannot tell anyone about your discovery. If you do, this is what will come of the human race. We will live in chains for a hundred years and perhaps much longer. He snapped his fingers and I woke up to find myself back in bed, in my home once again. It was morning, 
and birds were chirping outside my window. The possibility occurred to me that all of this could have been a nightmare. It felt so real, I thought to myself. But still, my discovery was too big to ignore. I couldn't just let it go to waste. I went over to my desk again and looked at the unsent email from the night prior, which I tried to send to my boss. The coordinates of the planet and the makeup of his atmosphere, so similar to Earth. It was all right there, waiting to be seen. I couldn't help myself. I hit the send button. I know some of you will be upset with me, but you don't understand. This discovery is going to be huge. It's going to change the world. It's going to change everything.